In the next two videos, we're going to look at artificial neural nets, also known as neural nets. These are methods that are useful for both prediction and classification. As opposed to linear regression, these are much more black box algorithms in the sense that it's more difficult to understand the relationship between the predictors and the outcome. The reason they're called neural nets is because they were designed to mimic the way our brain functions so that we learn. Let's look a little bit at what these neural nets are and how they work. Remember regression models. We used linear regression and logistic regression in the context of prediction and classification. When we have a numerical outcome, we use linear regression to predict an outcome y from a set of predictors x's. We did this by specifying a mathematical equation that links the x's to the y. Now, although the equation looks linear, we know that linear regression can be used to model relationships that are nonlinear. We do that by transforming either the outcome or the predictors or both. For example, we talked about the log transform where we take the logarithm of the outcome on the left-hand side. When we talked about classification or a binary outcome, we used logistic regression. And there, similar to linear regression, we were able to write out an equation that shows us the relationship between the outcome and the inputs. The difference was that we were looking here at a nonlinear function of the outcome, which is called the logit. We're actually going to see this logit come into play in neural nets as well. So how is linear regression related to neural nets? In fact, we can think of regression as a very simple form of a neural net, conceptually. Neural nets are usually described using some kind of a graphic that looks like this. On the one hand, we have inputs. These are x measurements, our predictor measurements. And on the other side, we have an outcome of interest or multiple outcomes. We see that there's also an additional layer in the middle, which we'll talk about soon. But the idea here is that with a neural net, we're able to model a more complicated relationship, an even more nonlinear relationship between the outcomes and the inputs. So the idea behind a neural net and why it's so complex is that we're trying to capture complex relationships between an output and a bunch of inputs. The key here is to notice that what we're doing is simply using derived variables or transformations. If we're using the ordinary notation of y to denote the output or the outcome and x to denote a predictor, what we're going to use here is g of x, which talks about a derived input variable. For example, if we're looking at the logarithm of x, then g is simply the logarithm function. What a neural net is going to do is it's going to model y, the outcome, as a set of derived variables, a derived variable of a derived variable of a derived variable of the x's. And that's why we're able to capture very complex relationships, but also why it's more difficult to see or understand the relationship between the original predictors, x, and the outcome, y. Let's see what kind of derived variables we talked about earlier. Can you recall in regression what types of derived variables besides the logarithm function we saw? We're going to get to those soon, so keep those in mind and think about what we remember. As I mentioned, it's typical to denote a neural net in this graphical form, such as the one shown on this slide. On the left side, in this case, we have the input layer, which relates the inputs, the predictors, all the way to the right side where we have the output, and we have something called an output layer. A neural network has an architecture, meaning the different components fit in together, through something called layers. In this particular network, we have three layers, an input layer, an output layer, and something called a hidden layer in the middle. We'll see later that we can have more than one hidden layer, but we'll always have a single input layer and a single output layer. We'll also see that in each layer, there are what we call nodes. These circles here are what we call nodes. But in fact, it's a fancy name for something that we've already encountered. A node is simply a derived variable. So just remember, we have inputs. This is data coming in. We have outputs on the other side. Those are our predictions, our classifications. And we're going to be taking all kinds of derived variables of the inputs 
in order to reach the output. The tricky question is, what should be the weights, these w's and thetas here, so that we get the best relationship that is most predictive of the outcomes from the inputs? As I mentioned, in this example, we have a single hidden layer, but we can have more, although a single hidden layer is often sufficient. But notice something special about this network. All the arrows are pointing only from left to right or within the particular layer. This is typical of a neural network. The idea is that output from one layer is the input into the next layer. We do some computation on the data in this layer, and then that will move into the hidden layer. Then some computation is going to happen on the nodes in the hidden layer, which will provide outputs that would be fed as inputs into the output layer. If we want to think of this mathematically, we can write the output from a certain node j as in some kind of a function g of the weights that happened from the previous node to that particular node, plus some kind of a parameter that is computed from that node. These w's here are called weights, and the trick is to find the weights that create a model that is most predictive of the y from the original x's. The function g, which we said are simply taking derived variables, is called the activation function. And the most typical functions that are used in neural nets are linear, which just means taking a linear function of the inputs, or taking an exponent, so that's the exponential activation function, and finally, very common, are what we call S-shaped functions. You've already encountered an S-shaped function previously. If you think about logistic regression, we've encountered the logit function, which is an S-shaped function. Finally, these thetas are also parameters in the neural net, but they have a different name. They're called the bias, and they control the contribution of each node to the entire model. If we look at a particular small example where we only have six records and we're trying to predict the acceptance of a certain cheese given two inputs, the fat score and the salt score. So we have x1 and x2 and acceptance is the y. Suppose we want to build a network based on these data. Suppose we're using the same architecture or structure that we saw before. We have an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. In this case, because we have two predictors, our input layer will include two nodes, one for fat and one for salt score. Here we're just putting together a hidden layer, and suppose we use three nodes. We'll talk about how many to choose later on. What we're going to be doing is computing different things from the inputs into the hidden layer, and then computing things from the hidden layer to produce the output, which is supposed to be the consumer acceptance. The final output of the output layer is actually a prediction. In this particular example, you'll see that the weights were actually computed. This is what the software does behind the scenes when it's training a neural net. The idea at the end is that when we feed a new record through the network, it will give us a prediction or a classification. In this example, we, we get a probability, and then we'll have to put a cutoff on it and determine what would be the classification, a 0 or a 1. If we use a cutoff of 0.5, then obviously this record would be classified as a 1. In this example, you could see that we also use a special activation function. If this looks familiar, this is the logit function. You'll notice, for example, that to get the output of node 3 here, what we're going to do is we're going to take the parameter negative 0.3, right here, this is our bias, and we're going to combine all the weights of arrows that lead to node 3. 0 0.05 here times the input, this gives us the part here, and the other arrow that leads into node 3 is the arrow from node 2 with a weight 0 0.01, which we multiply by 0 0.9. Together, we'll put them into the logit function, and this will give us the output of node 3, which is 0.43. You can see now that the next step will be to do the same thing for nodes 4 and 5, and then combine them to obtain the outputs for node 6. In this example, we had a single hidden layer. So we had three layers, an input, a hidden, and an output layer. 
But of course, we can have more hidden layers, which means taking more derived variables of the previous layer. Of course, what this will give us is a more complex model. But remember that sometimes too complex means overfitting. So a very good question to keep in mind when you're running neural nets is how complex do we really need to keep our model? Let's look at really simple examples, which will show us the relationship or the conceptual relationship between a neural net and previous models that we've looked at. Suppose that we look at a net that has no hidden layers, only an input and an output layer. And suppose that we're using an activation function that is linear. So g is simply a linear activation function. Here's a graph of what this would look like. We have predictors, and here are the nodes of the input layer. We're going to be combining them with some weights, and we're going to have an output layer, which will give us the prediction. If we use a linear function here of all the nodes, does this look familiar? I gave you a hint by using betas for the names of the weights instead of w's. I can take this network and simply write it out as a linear regression, where the output is a linear function of the outputs from the input layer. In other words, linear regression is very similar conceptually to a neural net with no hidden layers. It is not identical because of the way these weights are estimated, but conceptually, this is the idea. Let's look at a second example. Suppose again that we have only an input and an output layer, no hidden layers, and now the only difference from before is that we're going to use an exponential activation function. What does this look like? We've also encountered these. Can you try and write out the equation? Stop the video and see if you can figure it out. OK, so let's see what this looks like. This is going to look exactly like the previous model, except that now we have an exponent before this combination. Instead of writing it as an exponent, I'm going to take a logarithm on both sides, which brings us back to a very familiar linear regression where we log transform the outcome. So once again, a very similar type of model to what we've seen in linear regression, except again that the betas here would be estimated somewhat differently than we do that in a regression. Let's get back again to those activation functions. As I mentioned, a very common type of function is the S-shaped function. And the reason that S-shaped functions are used very commonly in neural nets is that they have two very good properties. One is if you have very large and very small values, very extreme values, the S function actually squashes them. If you look at the graphs here, you'll see exactly what I mean. If we look at very large values here, or very small values here, they're still squashed. The other reason that these are popular is that an S-shaped function has a big chunk of it that is quite linear in the middle. So we're able to do to capture the linearity, and when we have the extremes, we basically squash them in a certain way. We've seen the logistic function before when we talked about logistic regression, and this is the equation down here. Another very common S-shaped function is called the hyperbolic tangent function, or tanh. And it also looks very similar to a logistic function. The mathematical equation is down here, and you can see how similar it is to a logistic function. You'll notice in software that sometimes you'll be able to choose between one or the other. Finally, let's look at one third example. And now, let's use an S-shaped function. So again, a network that has no hidden layers, except that here we're going to use the logit activation function. And this gives us, again, something familiar. We're taking the inputs, we're taking a logit function of their combination, together with these betas, and the bias beta 0, and that will give us a logistic regression type equation. So in a sense, again, neural nets are a generalization of the concept of regression, although the main difference is that these betas, or more generally the w's and thetas, will be estimated in a different way. Let me show you a nice little demo that I found online that shows how this model is actually trained. How do we find these coefficients? And then how do we deploy this network in order to predict or classify a new record?
The example here is of a classification problem where we're trying to identify a digit, a handwritten digit, between 0, 1, 2, or 3. We let the model train on lots of examples. You can see here example is training data, where the top row are zeros, the next row are ones. If you look carefully, you'll see them twos and threes. We're going to feed these examples to the network and let the network learn the coefficients based on these examples. And then we can try and give it a new handwritten digit and see whether the network recognizes it and is able to classify it correctly. You can get to this applet by going to the link at the bottom. How does this work? We're going to randomize the weights. And you see that at this point, we have three layers. This network goes from the bottom to the top. The input node has here 20 boxes, which correspond to 20 input nodes. So our input layer has 20 nodes. The next layer in the middle here is the hidden layer. And the third layer at the top is the output layer. We have four nodes here because each one corresponds to a different class. The left one corresponds to a 0, the next one to a 1, a 2, and a 3. When we try to predict some kind of a handwritten digit, it will light up one of these nodes based on the probabilities that we see at the top. Before I train this network, I start with some random coefficients. Notice what's going to happen if I try to enter just a handwritten digit. Suppose I try to enter 0. I'm drawing a 0. We can see that the highest probability at the top is actually for node 2, which means that this untrained network would classify my nice 0 as being a 2. Now let's start training this network. And training means that we're going to start and feed it examples. We're going to give it all these examples here on the left and more. You can see how the different coefficients are changing as we're feeding more data. This is different from regression where we just get the weights at once. This is iterative and keep going on. I'm going to stop it for now, but actually you'll see that you need a lot more training to get the network to be accurate. Now let's try again to predict a new digit. And suppose I'm again using a zero. Now the network is clearly indicating that the highest chance is that this is a zero. And in fact, this is correct. Now let's go a little bit behind the scenes to figure out how these weights are actually estimated. As I mentioned, this estimation is iterative. What we're doing here is we're not taking all the errors from the whole model, bunching them together and minimizing that sum at once, like we do in regression, but instead we're going to take the errors from every node and that will help us update the weights. The method is called backpropagation. That's the most common way to um, estimate to train this model. And the idea is to compute the errors from the last layer back to the first. So the errors keep propagating and getting worse and worse towards the end. What we're going to try and do in the training phase is go from the end and try and compute the errors from the back to the beginning. As I showed you in the applet, we start somehow randomly. Uh, we choose some random weights, and then we iteratively keep updating them as we feed more and more records, training records, into the model. The weights are updated. You can see the equation at the top here. So the new weight is the old weight, but it also adds something called the learning rate. And this learning rate is a number between 0 and 1 that is going to be multiplied by the error of that node. The bigger the error, we want our algorithm to actually change the weight. The learning rate controls how fast our algorithm learns. Sometimes we want it to learn very fast. On the other hand, if it learns very fast, it doesn't retain a lot of what it saw previously. And then finally, when we get our weights, we have to keep updating our output nodes, which will lead to new errors. So it's a very iterative process, and that's why it will take time to run a neural net and train it on data. This idea of backpropagation is the most popular way um, to train a neural net. This is again an example of a neural net, which is drawn from the bottom to the top, like the applet that we just saw. And the idea is again that the activity 
or the data that we put in flows from the bottom upward, but then we take the errors from the top and we use that to train the model and update our weights. The biggest strength of this approach is that it's able to find solutions even when, when the relationship is quite complicated between the outcome and the inputs. Finally, a biggest problem here is when you have this optimization that keeps running and running, you can actually get stuck in a local minimum and that can actually slow you down. There are more details in the book about exactly how these weights are updated. I will only mention that there's one more parameter that usually the user will have to choose, which is called the momentum. And this momentum comes in in the updating equations by making sure that the weights change in the same direction. So if they were positive, they will keep being positive, or if they're negative, they will keep being negative. And the reason there is, again, trying to help you not to get stuck into these local minima. There are two big options in how you run a neural net. One is called case updating, and the other one is batch updating. This option refers to how you use the training data and put it into the neural net in order to train. In the case updating, we're going to feed one record at a time, and we're going to update the weights every time a single record is introduced into the network. Once we complete a whole set of records, we call this an epoch or a sweep or an iteration. And then after we're finished with one epoch, we're going to return to the first record and feed it in again. That's the approach that Excel Miner currently takes. A different approach that might be a little cheaper computationally, but you can already see what we're losing there, is to feed the entire set of training records into the network. And only after you feed all of them do you update the errors. You can stop here and think about the advantages of doing one approach versus the other. But obviously, because there are two, there's not one that is always better than the other. The main question with a neural net and training it is when to stop. How much is enough? So a few different criteria exist. One is if we're looking at these weights and we see that they start changing very, very, very little from one iteration to the next, that's a good indication that we're, we reached a stable spot and we should stop there. Another more practical approach is looking at the misclassification rate or the prediction error. And when that is sufficiently low, and sufficient, of course, depends on our context, that's a good time to stop. Remember that you always want to stop as early as possible that gives you the required results, the simplest model that still works. And finally, you can also put some kind of a threshold on the number of runs that you're doing or if this is going to be run in real time, you might have constraints in terms of how long this algorithm can run. The biggest danger with neural nets, because it is such a complex model that is so flexible, is overfitting, which means that we fit the, the net so closely to the training data that once a new data point is introduced, it really is not going to predict very well. How do we restrict this overfitting? Well, one problem is iterations. If we keep going on and on and on and on, we're training the algorithm to fit the training data very, very closely. So how do we avoid it? One is, as we talked about in general, we look at a holdout set, a validation data set, and we can see what's happening to the error there when we keep improving on our training data. We can limit the number of iterations so that it's not excessive. We can limit the complexity of a network. And there are two things we can do there. One is in terms of how many hidden layers we include. More hidden layers means more complexity. And the second is how many nodes we include in the hidden layers. And of course, the more nodes we have, the more complex. And finally, we have this learning rate parameter, which can also control some of the fitting. And if we keep this number relatively low, it means that we're not going to let the network learn too fast, which means to overfit the training data very quickly. To make sure that you got the main points regarding neural nets in this part of the video, see if you can answer the following question. A neural net will have an advantage over regression type methods when there is little training data, when the relationship between the outcome and inputs is complex, when the input outcome relationship is highly nonlinear, when the training time is limited. You can choose one or more and see if you can figure out which are correct answers. Better, see if you can figure out 
why the correct answers are the correct answers.